So this outline for today, we're going to start by uh, describing why we should rehabilitate our streams, why we should design them um, in a, a way that promotes uh, healthy ecosystems, some of the issues and challenges that we face, and I'll go into some of those in quite a bit of detail, as well as um, Mike Harvey. Um, and then uh, the session that um, Steve is going to lead is all about the how to, how do we do this? Um, um, and then from there, it's um, a bit of a strategy session of uh, where we go from, from here uh, with our limited budgets and so forth. And then that will conclude um, prior to one o'clock and then heading into the field session. So starting up, uh, why should we rehabilitate our streams? So uh, first up is the, the state of our streams is quite a, a large proportion are uh, not in good shape. Um, we'll then talk about uh, well, what does make a healthy stream? What are the key ecological values of the different stream types in Tasman? I'll just go into that very briefly and um, touch on cultural values. Then Lisa's going to talk about the legislation and policy, particularly Tamana Otuai, and very briefly, some of our rehabilitation programs that we've got underway right now. So um, the macro invertebrate community index is a really good integrated uh, uh, measure of the state of our, our waterways um, and water quality. And we can map these spatially. Um, so you can see here a map on the bottom left showing the, the Takaga Valley. Um, the hill fed streams in green are in, in really good state. So that's above 120 macroinvertebrate community index units. But those smaller streams in the lowland areas are in the orange bracket. Uh, so beneath 100, and that's where we need to kick in with some um, uh, uh, improving, particularly where it's below 80, so the, the red ones, um, it's hard, hard to see on that, that map, but there's quite, there's about 150 kilometres of stream that are in that red zone. So uh, uh, it is below the bottom line of the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management. Mm. So the, the graph on the right there shows the different uh, land cover classes um, and a, a plot of the MCI. So P is for pasture. It's got the greatest range of the health of, um, of, of waterways from, from very poor, but there's a, quite a few in the oh, excellent category. Our urban streams are all in the very poor category, so they are hammered from um, uh, there's no urban streams in the good and excellent categories. Then we've got um, S stands for scrub and indigenous forest. Um, those two are mostly or all in the excellent category. And then exotic forest also sits in that really good category. So um, that just shows you how um, the effect of, of land use on our um, river systems. And then um, uh, the model that uh, produced that map to the left there, it can spit out a summary of um, the MCI across the, the whole region and how um, the percentage of streams that are in that D band, that, that below 80. Um, uh, the, so that's 1% of all streams uh, overall. Um, but if you just take a percentage of pastoral streams, it's about 3% of all pastoral streams. And that is equivalent to 150 kilometres of stream. So, um, and uh, here's another uh, map showing just quite a few little creeks here that are in that red um, below 80 MCI units. Um, you probably, some of you will note that uh, the uh, MPS is now using 70 um, rather than 80 uh, MCI units, but um, we'll, I haven't redone this analysis. so. We'll get to that. The macroinvertebrate community index in lowland and springfed streams is in the worst state. Uh, this picture here is a tributary of the Motipipi, but uh, uh, Seb has got some pretty uh, um, cool designs to integrate wetlands and a meandering stream into this as it once uh, might have been in, um, in the past. We're talking 
rehabilitation because it's not we um, are not likely to be able to go back to um, a pre-human condition. So restoration is probably a, uh, a word that's a bit too strong in the space. And that's why we're using the word rehabilitation rather than trying to go back to, to the pre-human condition, which is probably unrealistic in many circumstances. But we want to take it um, as, um, well, we've got high expectations, high, high um, aspirations uh, in this space. So um, then the lowland streams are also, as I said in the previous slide, um, that's the uh, fox and whisker plot on the left, shows a range. Um, uh, it does go up into the into the very good as well. Spring fed are often in a degraded state as well. That's the SP central hill fed um, are in a better better state. And also the air, um, they're way up, up there. They get, um, you know, uh, mostly surrounded by indigenous forest and um, clean water systems. I uh, just mentioned a couple of other parameters, dissolved oxygen and temperature, are often really, really important for our lowland waterways. Again, the smaller streams, these red dots represent um, where dissolved oxygen is, uh, uh, we've recorded particularly low levels of dissolved oxygen. This is in summertime when um, the photosynthesis is um, causing it at, at night, the respiration causes the uh, uh, consumption of oxygen and uh, uh, that reduces the oxygen in, in the waterway. During the day they photosynthesize producing oxygen, so wild fluctuations and that is really not good for our freshwater ecosystems. Uh, small is beautiful here. Um, smaller streams are the most vulnerable and, and often the most impacted, but they are also the most important for our biodiversity. Per square meter, they hold the uh, greatest um, abundance of fish and, and diversity of, of fish. So the plot on the right there is uh, the stream order from one being the smallest streams, so the, the, the tiniest twig on the branch of a tree, if you like. Um, and then when two small twigs come together, they form a, a second order. So that's a, a, a little um, bigger branch and etc. as we go up the orders of, of stream. So um, this stream, this picture on the on the left, is about a, a third or fourth order stream in the Motapapi catchment. Mm. It's got great meander, but um, it's got a few other things going wrong that we will talk about later. So some of you will, will have seen me talk about this, this slide. I think it's a, a great photo showing all the elements of habitat that we are wanting in the stream. So um, first up, there's the overhanging uh, trees, uh, undercut banks, the meander, shallow riffles, uh, deeper pools, uh, cover for fish. So there's, there's uh, logs and branches that uh, fish really need to hide underneath. It's got natural substrate and a great range of size classes of gravel and, and also the, the wood. Um, it's got floodplain connection with these um, small beaches and, and natural uh, floodplains. Um, and um, uh, that is a, um, a natural system. That, that particular stream is a Black Valley stream in, uh, near St. Arnold. And uh, it, uh, mm, yeah, it has an urban um, development and farmland up, upstream, but it's still maintaining quite a few of those elements that's um, really important. Just going to give a bit of an overview for some of our different stream types that are um, a bit more degraded in our, uh, in our region. Wetlands are being drained uh, in the Mutri Ecological District, only 5% uh, of wetlands remain. Uh, wetlands are so important for species such as giant kokopu, for um, uh, kakihi, the, the freshwater mussels, uh, etc. Uh, they're very stable, um, often um, quite deep, and it also has a mix of um, uh, species that live in more uh, deeper, slower flowing environments like damselflies and, and, sorry, um, and dragonflies and so forth. Uh, so lowland fed streams, uh, they 
are uh, where the, the gradient is, is lower, where it comes off the hills. Um, it's a depositional environment, um, so a lot of sediment drops out into these areas. Uh, it's um, it, it often in, in floodplains, um, and uh, this is a, a very important ecosystem that um, I think we need to prioritise as well for, for restoration. Um, so Edna and uh, 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 Raylene will be able to explain this, this better than, than I, but rather than dump them straight into it, um, this is a, uh, a paper that um, has come out of Manaki Whenua in association with a number of iwi members such as Gail Tipper and others, looking at um, some of the uh, indicators that are really important to the health of um, or the Māori of the, the waterways. So water depth and minimum flows, the kai, the quality and availability, uh, the abundance and presence, scarcity of um, Tonga species, uh, in-stream nutrients, native fish species, uh, again abundance and um, presence, absence, scarcity, natural flow and flow variability, uh, health of Waipuna, the springs, um, as well as the aquifers that feed them, the health of the wetlands, and uh, very importantly, the interconnections between the awa, uh, the rivers and the people. Mm. OK, now I'd like to hand over to uh, Lisa McGlinski, team leader from our policies team, to talk about uh, some of the uh, statutes, particularly the most recent um, statute that really directs a lot of our work here, the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Trevor. Um, I guess a lot of you may already know a lot of this, so I will try and keep this brief. Um, I guess uh, the the key piece of um, legislation that Trevor mentioned is the National Policy Statement for Freshwater. Um, that came in as part of a, a package of um, pieces of legislation and instruments in 2020, uh, dubbed the Essential Freshwater Package. Uh, that included the, the National Policy Statement, but also the National Environmental Standard for Freshwater, um, and also some regulations for stock exclusion and water metering. Um, we've also just recently had the Water Services Act, um, which affects um, drinking water and also wastewater and stormwater that has overlaps with the national policy statement. Um, and also next year we're expecting regulations for freshwater farm plans, a new drinking water national environmental standard, which will likely be beefed up with source water protection um, requirements and also further changes from the Three Waters Review, um, in, including potential th things like water and uh, wastewater standards. Um, so there's lots going on in the freshwater space from a, a legislative point of view um, and, and obviously not forgetting the, the Resource Management Act review as well, um, which is also going to be putting in a lot of changes over the next sort of three to four years. Um, so there's still a lot of uncertainty. Um, there's quite a few changes still underway, even with the legislation that's been put out. So, for example, the National Environmental Standard for Fresh Water is still undergoing review and fixing um, a whole bunch of implementation issues that were identified once it had been gazetted. Um, in terms of the National Policy Statement, that's the main focus for my team, um, and that's to implement that through our Resource Management Plan review um, to create our new whole um, plan, the Tasman Environment Plan, um, which we're looking to have notified in 2024 to meet the deadlines in the RMA for the NPS implementation. Um, the National Policy Statement has basically got two parts, uh, two key parts to it. The first is to Mano Te Wai, um, which essentially sets the purpose um, for the policy statement, and it's defined through the hierarchy of obligations, um, which means basically in all our decisions around freshwater management, we must first provide for the health of water bodies, secondly, human health, and thirdly, everything else, so social, economic, and cultural well-being of individuals and communities. Um, to Mano to Wai is the key concept that drives through the National Policy Statement. Uh, it first appeared in the 2014 version. Um, there's been a National Policy Statement for Freshwater since uh, 2011, so it's quite a while now. Um, it's been strengthened throughout the variations and amendments to the policy statement, and um, in the latest 2020 version, we are now required to give effect to Te Manu Te Wai, um, and that term has specific legal meaning um, in case law, which essentially boils down to we actually have to do stuff to achieve it now, not just um, you know have regard to it and think about it. Um, 
it's actually, it's actually that key driver. Uh, the second big chunk of the national policy statement is the national objective framework, or the NOF, um, and this essentially identifies the process that we need to follow to implement the national policy statement. This requires us to identify freshwater management units across the region, or FMUs, um, and then we have to define uh, long-term visions, values of water and outcomes sought in each FMU. Um, the long-term visions and the outcomes for water were new additions to the 2020 um, MPS, so they weren't in the previous versions. Um, in terms of the NOF process, we then have to define attributes for each of those values and assign a target state for those. And anywhere that our current state um, doesn't meet our target state for an attribute, we are required to have action plans to get us there over time. Um, and so that's quite a key change in terms of how um, the MPS is actually going to be implemented over time. Um, the action plans won't be limited to just a council regulatory response. Um, it will also include things like monitoring and investigation, works and services, education advocacy, uh, financial subsidy, and also partnerships with EWE community and other organisations who are doing uh, work around the region regarding um, water bodies and water body health. Um, there's four compulsory values under the MPS um, that apply nationally to all water bodies, um, including both surface and groundwater. Uh, they are ecosystem health, which includes water quality, water quantity, habitat, aquatic life and eco ecological processes. Um, the next one is human contact, um, threatened species and mahinga kai. Um, so those have to be considered right across the board. There are also another nine national values that we need to consider whether they apply in each of our freshwater management units. Um, and also the communities can identify any other values that they want through the NOF process as well, which is um, something we'll be undertaking in the next sort of year or two. Um, this has already occurred in the Nelson process, if anyone wants to have a look at where this might um, sort of land, um, and they identified quite a considerable number of additional values on top of the ones in the national policy statement, um, and we're anticipating those same values potentially being used across um, Tasman, particularly in light of um, the fact that we may be looking at, um, if not planned amalgamation, then council amalgamation with Nelson at least, if not Marlborough. Um, there's a number of ways through which Tamanu Te Wai is going to be implemented um, through Council. Uh, the first obviously is through the new um, Tasman Resource Management Plan. Um, now, as I said before, we're looking at public notification in 2024 for that, but we'll be looking at putting out a draft for community feedback in 2023. So there's an awful lot of work to do there um, to get us there, but we'll be likely looking at the Nelson plan, the Nelson process as a starting base for that. Um, we're currently working with Iwi across the top of the south, um, and over the next year we'll be looking to develop a freshwater framework that implements Te Manu Te Wai across Te Tau Ihu. Um, there's also a second pathway in terms of directly affecting council functions um, through asset management plans and assessments. Um, the, interestingly, the 2020 MPS identifies at the beginning that Tamanu Te Wai is relevant to all freshwater management and not just to the specific aspects of freshwater management referred to in this national policy statement. I don't think I've seen a similar statement like that in, an, in another MPS. Um, but we are seeing its inclusion elsewhere, um, and an example of that is in the Water Services Act, which was um, just gazetted in October of this year. Um, and uh, that, while it focuses on drinking water, it also includes a section on protection of source waters, um, and there's also references to stormwater and wastewater networks in that Act. Um, and Clause 14 of the Act notes that when exercising <coughs> or performing a function, power or duty under this Act, a person must give effect to Tamanu Te Wai to the extent that Tamanu Te Wai applies to the function, power or duty. So we're starting to see it not just in the NPS itself and the RMA, but through other Acts as well. Um, and I'm thinking that we'll probably see it um, be embedded even more thoroughly through the resource management review process and the subsequent Acts that, that are going to replace the Resource Management Act. Um, what else did I want to say? Uh, there's also a greater expectation um, from EWI through the process for involvement in freshwater decision making um, and there's actually a legal obligation for that now um, within the National Policy Statement for Freshwater and the discussions we've had with EWI so far have highlighted that they are really looking at this in the long term, um, so not just through that 2024 deadline for the freshwater plan but right across council um, and right through to the, the, the short term, the long term and the very, very long term. 
um, and there is an expectation that they will be seeing the implementation of Tamanul Tawai across all council functions. <coughs> um, Trevor, did you want me to just touch on the NES at all, or? Um, I, it was so briefly. I, I just wonder whether um, Alistair Stevens might like to come in here um, on the back of our conversation uh, last week about um, how um, you saw this fitting into into your work in, in terms of uh, uh, yeah, re, um, redesigning streams and, and whether you've got any questions for, for Lisa in that area. Alistair? Um, thanks, Trevor. Um, yeah, obviously it has a huge effect on what we're doing, um, and I'm I'm still doing a, a lot of research into how it it affects what we're doing. Um, yeah, I, I think I've got to do a, I've got to do a lot more um, understanding of how how it all works before I, I guess I make too much of a comment. Uh, I think the main thing for me is that. Um, my role is um, constructing infrastructure that involves water bodies means that this is one area that influences my work. And so trying to get a feel for um, how much uh, weight that should be given, whether it should be 100%, everything else should um, give way to these objectives or somewhere else in the scale. Um, so that's one of the very difficult tasks that I've got to manage. Um, so, so I, yeah, I think I still need to do quite a bit more work on that to, to form a position, um, whether I form one at all. Um, uh, yeah. I, I think to be fair, nationally, everyone is grappling with that same question. Um, there's, there's certainly been a lot of discussion around what Te Manu Te Wai means in practice um, and how the hierarchy of obligations should apply. Um, it is pretty clear that, that, you know, the hierarchy quite clearly states that the first obligation is to uh, water body health. Um, and I guess there's a there's quite a bit of a discussion still to be had, particularly with EWI around what that actually means. Um, and also the time scale around how we might achieve those things. So um, some of the issues that we've got around freshwater habitat health, you know, they're going to take decades, if not longer, to um, to really get any kind of um, traction on. So this, I, that's where I guess the EWI are looking at the long game here. It's, it's about looking for quick wins, but it's about actually embedding in things within our processes that are going to, over time, lead to where they want to get to um, regarding the health of our water bodies. Um, and I'm certainly hopeful that the process that we're going to be going through with them in the next 12 months will provide a bit more clarity as to what that actually means. Um, certainly in terms of the plan being notified in 2024, that will have a flow on effect to any resource consents that Council hold in terms of um, sort of structures and functions and activities that we do, um, including existing ones where we review those. But there's also a question for Council that we will be actually putting to the leadership team um, in, in the next few weeks or months about how we go about making decisions around freshwater management before that 2024 um, deadline when the plans actually has legal effect. So there's a lot of decisions being made now um, that have the ability to quite adversely affect on the health of water bodies um, and could be contrary to the spirit of Tamanu Te Wai. Um, and I think I'm very conscious that we're, we're looking to strengthen our relationships with iwi. Um, and I think that's going to be very difficult if um, sort of different parts of council are doing different things that aren't actually aligning with Tamanu Te Wai right from the get go. So um, that's something that we'll be putting to council um, for their consideration. Um, yeah, over the next month, and hope I'm hopeful that too that will provide some clarity going out to other departments and um, the various different functions that get affected by this. or Raylene want to speak to um, any of the um, points that Lisa raised in regards um, to iwi viewpoints? Yeah, I can't really comment at the moment. I'm just, yes. Yeah, no, Ushua's not here to talk about her bus tea, and I don't think. No. Right. Yeah, no worries. Should. We can talk about it in the field as well, but I just want to make sure you get the opportunity to. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, one thing I will okay. check, and I can send it out to um, the attendees once I've just confirmed, is that we do have a initial report from Tetel Ihu Iwi that have been involved in the Tamanawa Te Wai project so far, um, and that was just provided to the mayors and chairs uh, last week. So I'll just double check that that is now publicly available, and if it is, I can send it around. Um, and that outlines sort of iwi aspirations for fresh water and their initial thinking in terms of what Te Manu Te Wai means. Yeah. Now we've got so a quick just to question. button, sorry. Oh, so someone else go got a question for it. Uh, I was How just going to say, that? is that um, that report from uh, the iwi working group, is that going to have some more guidance around um, the level of consultation that iwi will want to have in terms of any work in waterways? Um, it's a reasonably high level document at the moment. It's sort of very much a first step in the process. Um, I think the next 12 months is probably going to get into more of that detail um, that you're, you're after. Um, and it's certainly at the moment, the focus is on the getting the regional plans across the top of the south and in, in place of that 2024 deadline. But um, certainly, I mean, the discussions will cover the whole the whole gambit of council functions and processes. So, yeah, sort of watch the space, I think, in the next 20, 12 months. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Um, we do have a question in the chat from Annette Litherland about uh, how is the global consent for constructed wetlands going? Uh, well, we um, obtained that consent uh, about uh, three months ago, and um, we now with Emma on, on board and uh, other support we can um, now be in a position to help um, uh, landowners and, and supervise through that consent uh, process. Obviously, we've got to have some um, confidence that those people undertaking uh, the works in constructed wetlands are um, doing it according to the conditions. Otherwise, we're, we're liable. So, But hopefully, that process will be reasonably straightforward with a bit of guidance, and then a, um, uh, that they should have a um, low level of pain uh, compared to the consent process any, anyway. Yeah, but we can talk about that in more detail perhaps um, Annette um, later on in the program. Okay. Tre Trevor, I'll just mention a, a couple of things just because I think, just in case anyone isn't um, familiar with them, I certainly recommend going away and reading the the parts of the essential freshwater package. Um, but just in terms of the National Environmental Standard for Freshwater obviously includes rules for activities in and around wetlands. Um, it also identifies that all riverbed reclamations are discretionary activities and also has quite a number of fish passage requirements for structures and water bodies. So um, that's certainly something, all of those aspects are things to be um, cognizant of during restoration works. But also the other one that some people forget about is the regulations for stock exclusion, and that's got some potential implications for our river land management um, areas where we might allow adjacent landowners to graze uh, river booms and stuff, and that has its own um, implications. So both of those are really good to, to have a read and be familiar with. Thanks, Lisa. That's that's awesome. Um, keep the questions coming through on chat, and we'll, we'll monitor those as we we go along. Um, we, yeah, Lisa uh, talked about the Tasman Environment Plan, and um, which takes over from the uh, Tasman Resource Management Plan. Um, we have the Land Development Manual as well, um, which is a, a strong um, <coughs> provides strong. Uh, so sort of direction for how we uh, develop um, particularly urban landscapes. But then we also have a lot of um, sort of internal to TDC documents such as the Good Practice Guide to Riverworks that uh, um, Shane and others in the river engineering team um, put together. Um, uh, we can, I think, uh, talk about those potentially in the field and uh, later on. So. Um, I just want to, uh, Lisa did, did mention about um, the policy statement responding to degradation because a lot of what we're talking about today is is responding to de degradation, that we must take action to halt or reverse this uh, degradation as a, um, a council um, operating in this space and we need to prepare action plans. So we've got a, got a lot of work to do in that space and we need to um, gear up for it. This is a both uh, as a council and um, we cannot do it alone. So it's a very much a whole of community approach. 
We must also take action that's proportionate to the adverse effects um, and the trends. Um, um, so, and and to, to, for the goal of achieving those attribute states in the NPSFM. And every action plan prepared under this clause must um, identify the causes of the deterioration, the methods to address those causes and evaluate the effectiveness of the methods. So very strong um, need for uh, a good um, diagnosis there ongoing. And I think that's something that um, we need to build in more. We've, um, we have done certainly done some monitoring um, of the, the work that we have been doing, uh, but there's a lot more that we, we could do. Uh, here's the land development manual. It has some really lovely words here about mimicking natural systems and processes for stormwater management. So uh, Walter and the team um, and others at Nelson City Council uh, did a lot of work on, on this document. Um, it, it's it really um, talking about protecting and enhancing the functions of natural ecosystems. So yeah, really strong words and um, big aspirations to fill. Mm. I'd um, like to just bring in right at this moment a, a um, concept that uh, Dr. Roger Young from Cawthron Institute um, put together. He put a paper in an international journal comparing um, the work that we do in rivers to uh, the medical profession and uh, that we uh, could really take a leaf out of the medical profession's book and looking at the, the approach that we take to rivers. So first of all, gathering information about the river. So we do fish surveys, we do river water quality, we, we assess the um, contaminants in the sediment. Uh, um, there's a lot of information we need to, to gather, just like we would um, gather a person's um, temperature, their um, heart rate, etc. Then we go through to providing a, a diagnosis to work out, well, what are we have to triage that often to, to work out what is the most important rate limiting step with with what um, the the health of the, the waterway um, and it could well be a lot of interacting factors, not just one one factor in that diagnosis. Applying the treatment, following that up with regular to regular monitoring and, and checkups. Um, hmm. And then um, from what has been learned through that process, uh, preventing that degradation happening in the future. So I think that that paper really helps us um, in that space and, and really challenges us to um, work in, in that framework. And here's a couple of quotes from uh, Roger's paper, Roger Young et al. And Roger's advised us um, in many steps along the way with our river water quality and uh, aquatic ecology monitoring programs. And he's uh, well recognized um, uh, uh, in New Zealand as a preeminent pre uh, scientist. So he's saying that often we, we know that something's wrong um, with the river system, but it's often difficult to pinpoint it as a community. So it's it's um, behoven on us as with a, perhaps a bit more knowledge than the average person in the community to actually um, try and show our wider community what is wrong with some of our rivers and uh, how to pinpoint that in, in other places. Um, and that actually as a, as a country, we're doing relatively little post treatment monitoring. So it's hard to know what really is working and, and what isn't working. Uh, so we need to up our game there as well. And it takes takes a bit of work that does. It's, um, some of the monitoring can be a, a large portion of the actual uh, treatment uh, cost. This is treatment by I meaning rehabilitation or, or or restoration type treatments that I'm I'm talking about. Now it's also uh, they challenge us to um, use uh, modern technologies such as eDNA, that's environmental DNA, so taking a water sample to uh, that um, characterizes the whole, um, all the species that are interacting with that water, including terrestrial birds, um, 
pest plants or, or, or indigenous plants that are in that waterway um, to the fish and the invertebrates, et cetera. We can tell a huge amount from eDNA and we're re really gearing up to use that more and more. We've used that um, to a certain extent and and, uh, and I know Le Annette Litherland has really done well to um, in, uh, in encourage community groups to uh, employ that technology. We're using drones and um, Blair Reed and our freshwater improvement team has now got his license um, and uh, many others around do. So that's really, really important to get those photo points to see those changes over time and uh, potentially in those the cameras on those drones to have spectral imaging so we can actually assess some of the um, the algae and, and other aspects of, of the waterway that um, can be really good indicators of uh, river health. So some really good challenges from uh, some uh, important scientists there. Um, and then, <clears throat> yep, we need more of this and combining it with good environmental education uh, to reduce the risk of uh, further river illness. So a challenge to all of us and, and um, thank goodness we've got people like uh, Annette and uh, CJ and um, many others that um, work in that environmental education space. So big shout out to you guys too. Um, now, this just wanted to touch on setting uh, objectives, such an important part of this. So once you've collected the background information, know some of the limitations of the system, um, then we need to set up sets measurable, achievable results are orientated and timely. So, um, you know, whether it's um, bringing back uh, uh, the giant cockapoo, you can see in the uh, lower part of that photograph on the left, uh, we have, uh, it seems that that species is going extinct more and more in catchments of Tasman Bay. Uh, we're just not finding it um, in places we used to regularly find it, and that's just getting uh, more and more. And so, uh, whether we want to hold that decline and that, that become one of our um, specific um, objectives, uh, it certainly has been for some of our projects like the Mutkapi, Nyman Creek, um, Pearl Creek, and, and others. But it um, may well be. Um, uh, coda or um, takahi, so that's uh, freshwater crayfish or freshwater mussel, or really um, taking a whole ecosystem approach is what we um, should also be thinking about and not just getting hung up on one species um, and, and looking at how they, because in these stream ecosystems they're all interacting uh, as well, but whether a Tonga species uh, and that's an objective that we really need to, to know from the community um, and that drives what we do and uh, we can then evaluate whether we've been successful or not. Now, Seb, do you want to say anything more about setting objectives? It's just such a fundamental part of what we do. Uh, well, to, uh, to, have, uh, to have clear objective at the beginning of a project is really essential, uh, of course. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's good to be uh, multi-objective um, and also, yeah, to target, as you said, some uh, some species maybe you want to have, like when you do a restoration project, you you want to have like some of the species in 10 years time. Um, it's good to do that, to have those targets, because then you can try to implement um, to have the habitats they need. So you need to have all the ecology they need. So yeah, so 10 years later, after your restoration work, you can find those those spaces, so it could be a success. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we've got very good knowledge now about the habitat requirements of particular species. Uh, so that is um, no longer really an, an impediment. So we can build it for th those species, in other words. Okay, so um, about 10.30, so we'll, we'll just, uh, we almost finished the, um, this uh, session and uh, then we'll, we'll have a um, little break. In fact, that is the end of that, that session. So um, if uh, people would like to just uh, take um, and grab uh, a cuppa or go to the bathroom, and what have you, and we'll join up again at, uh, at 10.40.
So thank you for your attention. And again, um, uh, put comments in the in the chat as, as we go along. Um, I see Annette's the only one so far. So I challenge others to, um, to to use the chat and ask questions. So see you back in uh, nine minutes now. Thank you. So we are now going to talk about uh, the issues and challenges facing us in this rehabilitation space. Um, and why oh, is it not coming up? Um, Zoom slideshow, is that? Um, so the first issue that um, uh, we need to manage is the um, the catch at the catchment scale. We need to look um, wider than the reach that we're um, investigating or uh, our proposed treatment reach. Looking from the hill, the ridge tops, um, to uh, to the sea and the delta delta systems. So um, this, this first. And I will let Mike uh, Harvey uh, speak to this, but it's all about how water falls on the landscape, how it transports sediment, how um, the, the, the flow um, interacts with the, the banks and the bed and uh, produces erosion and how it connects with the, with the floodplains and uh, uh, the, the land uses around and, and so forth. So I'm now um, going to hand over to, to Mike Harvey, who, as I um, mentioned in the introduction, has um, given a lot of his, his time to help us with uh, these projects, and um, uh, uh, particularly in the, in the Motri. Uh, and uh, yeah, he's got a, a huge amount of experience um, to, to bring to bear on, on this. So I'll just advance to your first slide. Um, here, uh, Mike, and uh, I'll um, let you take it away. Okay. Uh, thank you, Trevor. Um, so, so far, what we've really been hearing about is water quality and ecology. What I want to do is sort of put a little bit of em emphasis on the physical system uh, that basically the critters occupy um, and the sort of the, the, the dynamics of that. Um, Trevor, how are we going to advance this? Sorry. Uh, advance the slides? Yeah, just give me a nod and I'll, I'll do it. OK, all right. So basically, you know, all geomorphology really is, is understanding system dynamics. And it's pretty complicated um, because it involves the integra integration of a whole bunch of different things, geology, soil, vegetation, sediments, hydrology, hydraulics, and sediment transport. That's what creates essentially the physical system that's a river. Uh, that is then the, the, the source of habitat for species. Okay, next Trevor, thanks. So basically this has been, you know, this is not rocket science. Um, and E.J. Lane, oh, back in the 50s, came up with a really interesting way of thinking about this, and it was basically about equilibrium. E effectively, the streams that we are interested in for rehabilitation are by definition non-equilibrium. But before we go there, let's just define what equilibrium really means. It's really, it's a balance. And in essence, what Lane uh, postulated was that the uh, sediment transport in a river is balanced by the energy. And when those are in balance, then you have a balanced equilibrium river, basically. And this scale sort of shows you water on one side and a slope, that's energy. Uh, on the other side, you've got basically sediment. Now, one thing I'd really like to put in here is that both the term sediment and erosion are not obscenities in the river world. They're both very important uh, elements. 
Basically, a river's function is to move sediment through time and space. And so it's that movement of sediment that creates habitat, that creates changes in spatial position of rivers uh, as they meander, etc. Um, so what we have to focus on is really, it's not so much that sediment is a problem, it's whether we change the type of sediment, in other words, coarse material to fine material, uh, and the, the amount of sediment that's moving through the system. So remember that just because you hear sediment and you hear erosion, it's not all bad, and it doesn't all have to be fixed. And in fact, cutting off a sediment supply to a river system can have really negative impacts. Okay, Trevor. Okay, so let's talk about the sort of the general area around here, and let's look at some of the things that have changed and why we have changes in our river systems. Back in the 1840s or so, we deforested. We had major land use changes, kicked up the flows, kicked up the sediment yield. Wetlands were drained for agricultural purposes. It increased peak flows. Basically, you got more sediment from erosion. Water tables were lowered and base flows in the streams went down. Because we had such major changes in the catchments, we had a lot more flooding. People didn't want to be flooded. So they straightened up and channelized the streams. They made them more efficient to convey flood water, at least in the areas that were channelized, and often ended up with basically causing increased flooding further downstream. But the thing that really happened with the channelization was that they disconnected the channel from its floodplain. And so all that water that used to go out into the floodplain uh, to dissipate energy during floods now is contained within channel. And so now you have a really erosive situation. Um, as a result, I mean, even here, uh, here in the military where I live, back in the 1920s, things were so bad. They were sowing gorse for stock feed. Um, and it was because we had massive changes in both land use, um, erosion, and hydrology, basically. So what happened? We have rotations of pine trees that have been built. So what happens then? Basically, you put the pine trees in, the flows go down, the sediment goes down. But unfortunately, in 20 odd years time, you knock them down again. And so our flows go up and our sediment goes up. So our systems are being yo-yoed in many ways, our river systems. More recently, uh, it was decided that crack willows, for good reasons, especially for flood conveyance, were a problem in many of the streams um, in this general area. So they were removed. Now, removal of them essentially set off, in many places, cycles of erosion again. Um, I'm not arguing for crack willows. All I'm arguing for basically is that the consequences of removing riparian vegetation need to be taken into account. And then finally, especially in the sort of situation of uh, the Richmond area, urbanization. We've known since the 1950s some seminal studies that were done, the impacts of urbanization basically on hydrology, cranks up the flows, because we have less pervious area and generally cranks up the sediment and generally causes the loss of floodplains because people want to develop uh, as much of the land as they can and they build stop banks basically to give them an illusion of essentially safety. And what we found basically is that that floodplain is probably one of the most important things we can have from a public safety point of view. Levees are in many, or stop banks, uh, a short-term fix in many cases. Okay, Trevor. So, channels that need rehabilitation. Pretty obviously bed erosion up on the top left there uh, is one example. And you can see why. Above the head cut there, the channel is relatively small. It's connected to the floodplain. Uh, you would have overbank flows. Downstream of the head cut, 
the channel is confined. Basically, you've got banks that are maybe two to three meters high and highly erosive. Over on the right hand side, we have accelerated bank erosion. Um, and that's a historical factor. This river degraded because it was straightened historically. And so now we have over heightened banks and accelerated erosion rates. And then we also have situations where we've manipulated rivers and we have absolutely no habitat in the bed or on the channels. So these are candidates for rehabilitation. OK. So first rule of stream rehab. You have to have a basis of design. And that includes both physical and ecological components to it. And the really important point here is that if you don't, then you can never learn. You just don't learn. You know, the Dr. River bit uh, that um, Trevor put forward. Um, if you don't know, if you don't have that basis of design, you can't learn from success or failure. Everything is a one off. So I'm really pushing for design, basically. Know what it is you want to do, why you're doing it, how you're doing it, and obviously part of this is monitoring as well. Okay, next. And here's the next real problem with rehab. Frequently you get the thing, well, we'll go back to where we used to be. It used to work, therefore, you know, all will be good. Well, if you take a look at that picture on the right hand side, this is a stream in the Mutri, and you can see the historical channel was extremely sinuous. Small, sinuous. The modern channel is straightened down the middle of it. We see on the left side exactly the same thing, and that's in Mississippi in the southeastern United States. Same event. The point is we can never go back to that We've changed the system so much that that historic plan form is no longer suited to uh, hydrology and sediment supply in the modern system. So this going back to the past won't work. We have to look at what we're dealing with in the present. OK. Yeah. So, Mike, uh, I guess if you replanted the whole catchment in native trees and it allowed 50 to 100 years, maybe you could. <laughs> That's what you're saying, isn't it? But you can't go back uh, with the current land use, right? Exactly. Exactly. If you changed, if you change the hydrology and the sediment supply back to where it was, then that would be appropriate. Um, but you're not going to. Mm. And so it is an inappropriate target. OK, so there are ways of looking at this and fairly sim simple ways. This ternary diagram approach, three factors, really encapsulates a lot of what we need to be looking at. There are three elements to it. A it overbank flooding is sort of shorthand for or the frequency of overbank flooding on the on the bottom axis is shorthand for the channel capacity. Most channels that are in equilibrium have overbank flows somewhere between a two and a five year recurrence interval flood. Channels that have, you know, in-bank capacities that are 10 to, 10 to 50 or greater. I know channels that have got over 100 year capacity in them are obviously not in equilibrium. There's a hell of a lot of energy within that system. Bank stability is obviously an issue. Now, generally, uh, bank stability is a function of two things, the bank height and the bank angle. And we can define critical heights and angles from geotechnical uh, analysis. So we can look at them in terms of a continuum from stable to unstable on the left side of this diagram. And then the final one is the bed stability. And that's really a function of the relationship between how much sediment transport capacity you have and that remember go back to lane that's basically the amount of water and the slope and the supply of sediment essentially if you have more transport capacity than you have supply then the bed degrades the bed goes down it will erode 
And so we can go from unstable to stable there. So if we use this, then we can, at this sort of ternary uh, approach, we can establish what the problem is in a given piece of stream uh, that we're looking at. Okay, next. Yeah. So in, in some ways, that bed stability aspect, um, another way, another term would be down cutting or, or, yep. or degradation. A grading. Yes. Um, so it, um, it's not just the lateral stability; it's it's more the the, the um, how it uh, cuts down or builds up. Correct. The vertical plane, right? Yeah. Correct. So you know, let, let's just sort of look at a couple of examples of this. We'll we'll take now the diagnostic criterion of overbank flooding. So the top uh, channel, small stream. Uh, it overbanks frequently. It's my local stream down here, basically. Every time we get a decent rain, it goes overbank. That's great. It's connected to its floodplain. It's dissipating energy. So it would plot down here, basically, where A, down in the sort of infrequent, oh, sorry, in the frequent uh, corner on, on the diagram. The B is the Mutri ditch, basically. Um, it probably holds at least a 50-year recurrence interval flood in bank. So there's an awful lot of energy within that. So it plots out basically infrequent overbanking, if ever. Um, and the consequence of that is that we have bank instability and bed stability problems. Okay, next. Uh, looking at bank stability, again, uh, the top left picture is a bank that's failing geotechnically. It's failing because it is too high and too steep to support itself. And the reason for that is that the bed of this stream went down, it degraded historically. So now we have banks that are so high they can't support themselves, not with this geometry, as opposed to the lower one where it too is fairly deep, but the bank angles um, and the heights are within you know, essentially, they're strong enough to maintain themselves, basically. And what's interesting on this pic, that lower picture is you see where the broom comes in, in there, the yellow sort of about mid-bank region. Gives you a pretty good indication, basically, mm -hmm. that this is a re relatively stable uh, system. You know, woody plants are volunteering in, and what's more, they're volunteering in at an appropriate level hydrologically, okay? Mm -hmm. So that's the um, Powley Creek in the Lower Mutri. So all these yep. examples are, are local, um, or in, in Tasman District at least. And uh, uh, there's some really good uh, re um, planting I just noticed um, in this catchment uh, this winter. So uh, maybe Elliot's been involved there in, in, in the net. <laughs> so. Yeah. So then finally, let's take the third element of this. This is the bed stability. Well, if you look at the top one, top photograph there, A, obviously there is a head cut in there. There is a vertical discontinuity in the bed of the stream that is migrating upstream over time. And so basically that plots up there in the unstable field. The lower photograph is stable, basically, uh, but it's a pretty big stream. Um, and so there's a lot of energy in there. Um, the banks may not be as stable as we would like them to be. Um, but so we have to think about it in, you know, in sort of three dimensions. You can't think of it in, in, in one, two, or the three independently, basically. Okay, next. Sorry, did somebody put a question up there? No, okay. So. If we understand what the drivers are and where we are, we, it gives us an ability to look at treatments, what treatments are appropriate. And so if we go into the green sector there, we have fairly frequent overbank flows. Uh, so in other words, we've got connection to the floodplain. We've got pretty low banks and basically the transport capacity and the supplier sediment are more or less balanced. In general, we can get away with riparian planting in there if we need to do if we need to fix local erosion problems. If you go up into the red sector, in that case, basically we have to go mechanical. 
we have to put rock riprap in, you know, to control uh, vertical instability. And we've probably got banks that are so high that even if we grade them off, um, we can't, they won't remain stable. So we need to essentially add a mechanical component, a rock. Comp in most cases, it's rock. Now, down in the orange segment, though, we have fairly big streams, uh, not very frequent flooding, a lot of energy in the system. The banks tend to be quite high, probably because of historical impacts. The bed is more or less stable uh, because of historical changes. And there we probably go into bioengineering. And bioengineering is just a term of saying we combine basically traditional hard engineering with soft treatments. Um, so this gives us a, a, an approach to what will probably work most effectively uh, in, in a stream system, okay? All right, so um, I think, all right. Okay, so basically just, you know, three cases. So here we have a stream system. Again, it's all in the MUTRI. And you can basically see these are relatively small streams and any erosion problems along them, you can probably just fix them up with riparian plantings. It will be effective. We've got some rules of thumb. Basically, if the energy in the stream exceeds about uh, roughly 50 newtons per square meter, we probably are uh, exceeding the ability of plants alone to provide stabilization. Okay, next. Here we have vertical instability and lateral instability because the bank uh, can't um, support itself. Here we're going to have to come in with rock, basically. Um, and we're going to have to reshape we can't do it with plants, basically. It won't work. OK, next. And then for our bioengineering, basically fairly big systems. They're relatively stable vertically. They've got a lot of energy. Um, this happens to be the lower one here. Picture happens to be Bosselman Creek. And just recently, we've implemented TDC, have implemented a bioengineering report, uh, bank protection on this particular bank. OK. Yeah, that was a, a first for putting um, logs in our waterways for um, on behalf of our river engineers. So um, uh, awesome um, project and uh, maybe a site of a potential field trip in, in the future. So that's um, the, uh, Mike's um, section. Did you want to say anything more, Mike? We've got no, some I think, questions you know, chat. I think what I really summarized by saying is that before you start thinking about rehabilitation, you better understand um, what your system is doing uh, and where it is. And then you work with it, not against it. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, can I just, uh, Mike, can I just uh, add a comment here? So when you propose some solution like uh, bioengineering or planting some uh, riparian forest or whatever, uh, it, it is to fix the bank or the stability or the sediment problem, but uh, we can do more considering the ecology of the stream too. So you can do bioengineering into the green uh, shape and uh, also the red shape. So just just want to have that. So um, uh, thank you very much for your presentation and your uh, the sediment st uh, stability aspect, but uh, 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 we can integrate habitat for biodiversity a little bit everywhere. Uh, it's not uh, it could be integrated. Uh, it's not yet. And I guess the example of that, Mike, is, is um, that Bosselman Creek, that lower right photo there, where um, uh, Giles project managing that that with uh, uh, quite a lot of cover, so so logs and branches embedded in, in the wood and extending out over the the water. That that is uh, bioengineering within that rock within that um, uh, mechanical approach, um, is it not? So it's so we can get some uh, ecological improvement in that uh, mechanical uh, quadrant in the, in the red, as, as um, Seth has been saying. 
Oh, I agree completely. And I think that the important thing with bioengineering is that it implied in it that it is providing habitat value. Yeah, there's all sorts of different ways of doing it, basically. But it's basically it provides a bio, uh, it provides a habitat improvement as well as affecting the, the stability of the system. Right. I think that's implicit in bioengineering, as, as Seb said, basically. Yeah. OK, now, uh, CJ, would you like to just um, uh, say your question to the group, please? Oh, it wasn't a question so much as a statement that um, uh, climate change is going to mean those um, top planes are going to be more active. You know, 50 years is happening every 10 years currently. Uh, it's a little bit hard to, to hear you, but did you get that mic? Um, no, I didn't. Sorry, I didn't. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of distortion, yeah. CJ. So, um, Maybe we'll read out your written quest, uh, your written comment, and um, uh, or maybe there's something wrong with your mic. I, I don't know, but anyway. So um, uh, CJ saying it, she can't help but think how the time intervals for floods is decreasing with climate change. Uh, maybe the, the peak of the climate, uh, flood is getting higher, but uh, it's off the climate change. Yeah, CJ, we're really starting to hear you. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's one of the complexities that we're going to have to deal with because, you know, our recurrence intervals are all based on a historical record. Um, and we're pretty sure that our series is no longer stationary. So basically, what may be a two-year flood historically may become a one-year flood, you know. And so, yeah, we are going to have to deal with probably more frequent um, higher magnitude floods. And our systems are going to have to be resilient enough to um, handle that. Yeah, great, thank you. We've got another question from uh, Blair. Uh, I think if we can hold that question, because uh, Seb is going to give us lots of examples um, in, in that space in his talk, which is coming up um, in about um, oh, half an hour uh, or so. Mm. OK, so if that's um, all, Mike, we can move on. OK, Mike, to move on to um, the next part of the talk. Sounds good. So uh, um, I've just got a, a series of um, numbered um, points here about uh, the, the challenges that, that we face. Now, one is excessive fine sediment supply. I should have uh, qualified that with saying fine sediment. Fine sediment is uh, well recognized as one of the um, most insidious, the, the, the worst of the contaminants of our waterways, because it um, is so common, um, not just in our region, but all, all over the, the world, um, the, and particularly uh, if fed systems. That uh, uppermost photograph is Nyman Creek, uh, or both, both photos are Nyman Creek, actually, and uh, it's had a history of um, uh, mm, of uh, cultivation around it and runoff of that uh, sediment into the waterways. Also, we've had a um, uh, just the aquatic weed in that system is just prolific, and it's produced a huge amount of organic uh, sediment. So, composting material, you could say, on the bed of the the waterway. Um, that is robbing the waterway of oxygen. Um, it's just got a whole lot of, of issues. Um, so it's both sediment that's coming into the system um, and sediment produced by, by the plants growing in the waterway. It's out of balance and we are fixing that system with shading out the, the plants. I've dug out a whole heap of the, the sediment to try and um, reset it somewhat. We couldn't get all of the sediment out, but we've got about uh, three quarters of it out. And uh, um, we've got our summer student, um, Harrison Cruz, is, is working with us um, on, on that project. 
Uh, so we've, we've done quite a lot of work on um, excessive sediment supply from the Waimea and the Motuari catchments with Niwa, looking at uh, the sources of, of that. And if you Google um, sediment sources um, in the Tasman District Council website, you'll see a report by Niwa, by Max Gibbs et al, uh, that describes uh, where the sources of sediment comes from. It, um, the uh, prominence in those sources is um, uh, exotic forestry uh, from bank erosion and um, also in that bank erosion class is subsoil erosion from uh, where there are earthworks moving that, that subsoil. Mm. There is um, in the estuary cores that we've taken in the Waimea, it appears that the contribution of fine sediment from ex exotic forestry is, is getting less which is a, a good thing, um, but the uh, contribution from uh, pastoral land uses appears to be slightly increasing, or certainly increasing um, compared to, to forestry as forestry uh, goes down. Still work to do in all of those land uses, and uh, our policy team under Paul, uh, sorry, Pauline Webby is doing some really good work on um, land disturbance uh, rules and, and so forth. So the next point is um, dealing with the legacy of fine sediment. I mentioned Nyman Creek there. We've, we've also been digging out sediment from uh, the Motopipi and, and others. It's quite costly, um, but uh, we believe try and uh, get over this, the real problems with dissolved oxygen uh, over a legacy of, of a huge amount of sediment going into these systems. Uh, um, another point there that should be point number four is um, historical channel mod modification. So if we over deepen and over widen our systems, we reduce the flow rates, we reduce um, scour in the channel, uh, we get um, a greater rate of, of deposition and less re-aeration of the system, therefore dissolved oxygen is more of a problem. And of course, a lot of our streams, particularly in the lowland areas, have been straightened. Other uh, challenges are fish passage barriers, which many of you have heard me talking about lots. And we've got a wonderful project that's been managed by Kerry South, a project manager for the Freshwater Improvement um, Project, uh, working right across our, our district, uh, looking to assess over 4,000 structures over the next five years. So really exciting to manage that, but it's, uh, it's no good just doing that if the habitat upstream is, is no good. And point number five is uh, the degradation of um, fish spawning sites. So the picture on the uh, bottom right is uh, Lower Bork Creek, uh, the exotic grasses where Inanga uh, do spawn a lot. There's a bench at just the right height, and that's, that's uh, a really good place for, for Inanga spawning. But a lot of our uh, smaller streams running into estuaries are, have steep banks, very U-shaped um, channels, and, and that is really no good for fish spawning. There are some waterways uh, where the larger boulders and, and larger uh, substrate has been removed. That's really important. Those uh, underneath those rocks are where species like uh, kuaro, bullies and, and others uh, spawn and that's that's in stream. Um, and then uh, species such as uh, giant kokopu and uh, banded kokopu, they really like these benches alongside the stream, but it has to be at a particular height above the stream and it needs to be relatively flat, that bench, um, and not too steep, otherwise they will not spawn there. Again, there's been a lot of research in New Zealand, we know our spawning sites, we have to get spawning sites right to have a healthy system as well. Um, we have um, the uh, flow, managing our flows in our, our waterways, so this uh, incorporates the um, <clears throat> the use of water for, for irrigation and so forth, and, and when do we kick in with flow restrictions. So this picture, Tinga Bridge, it's taken during a, a, a relatively extreme low flow for our region. 
in uh, 2019. The red line on the bank on the true right, the left as we're looking at it, is, um, is the mean annual low flow and you can see how it's receded um, to a, a more extreme low flow condition and that that reduced habitat um, can have effects for, for years to come within that, that system. In our smaller waterways um, it also has, has real real issues and uh, during that particular period of time we saw Pukeko just um, having a great time fishing out um, giant kokopu, bandu kokopu out of, out of small streams around the, the district. So it, they're very vulnerable to predation um, during these very, very low flow um, events. Um, so there's a question relevant to that discussion. So Lisa, do you want to just uh, speak to that, please? Um, yeah, thanks, Trevor. I was just wondering if we had an idea about some of our other fish species and where they might be spawning. In particular, I understand that some of the galaxids spawn in sort of the mid catchment areas on freshers rather than sort of down the bottom like the Enung, and whether we know where those are. Ah, yeah, yeah very good question. We, um, we haven't in Tasman done uh, spawning surveys for uh, those galaxid species like uh, Kuaro, like uh, giant kokapu, like uh, short jaw kokapu, and um, etc. Um, Nelson City has done a little bit. They found uh, Kuaro, uh, they're spawning under stones, sort of the, the size of um, perhaps a, a suitcase in volume, or maybe um, half, half a suitcase, probably. In, um, in size and just below the brook sanctuary in the brook um, is quite a, a good spawning site for Kuaro. I've um, certainly it's on on the list to, to do in our, our region uh, but uh, we yeah I've certainly been to quite a few spawning sites in other regions um, even in, in um, the urban area of Hamilton some of the tributaries of the Waikato Rura are really important um, giant kokapu spawning sites uh, in the in the gully systems of Hamilton, and um, there it's it's these um, flatter benches uh, in the long grass where they're where they're spawning. So, um, short answer is we haven't done those um, spawning surveys for our other native fish in Tasman, but um, it's a lot on the list to do. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, so contaminant discharges. Um, my photo didn't come out in the right slide, but that one up in the top right. Uh, just on Reservoir Creek at uh, Salisbury Road, just upstream of the a ASB Aquatic Centre. Um, I first um, looked at that um, piece of the concrete where that uh, drain flows out into, and I saw it was uh, really white. The, the algae that was growing on there was bleached white. And for, for me, that was an absolute red rag. I thought, well, what's going on here? And then I poked my head into the pipe and it was a very strong chlorine odour coming from that and I thought oh that's what's caused um, that algae to be bleached and um, yeah look further downstream there were several dead fish all over the place and um, this continued for some time before we finally fi found the source which was a school swimming pool and uh, backwashing of their filters uh, so this sort of thing happens very very regularly in our urban stream networks and one of the reasons why uh, you saw the beginning urban streams are some of the in the worst health of, of all. If that um, discharge out of that pipe, um, which usually occurred um, at low flows, could be directed into um, an area of wetland or even just soil, it would be intercepted and not in the stream, not take the brunt of it and all the life get affected by it. So yeah, contaminants and streams take a lot of um, different um, varieties um, from nutrients uh, to um, from septic tank discharges uh, etc etc. Uh, from point source and uh, discharges from farms like dairy farms that has improved hugely over the, um, the years but non-point source discharges so that's where runoff comes off pastures, uh, critical source areas where you know, the flow of a creek might run through an area of cropland uh, or an area of intensive grazing or, or so forth and washes into 
to remember those. Uh, that is our biggest challenge for our farming land uses now. Uh, for the next point down there, bank erosion. Um, there's, uh, I think we're getting better and better in the space at, at uh, providing for um, better ecological out outcomes with that protection and not over protecting and becoming more like uh, uh, heavily rock walled and uh, like industrial channels. Stream down cutting, Mike has mentioned that and uh, uh, really um, done well. This is my last um, slide on this sequence. Um, there's uh, challenges around excessive algal growth, particularly due to nutrients. Um, the, the streams in the Waimea Plains are uh, the worst of the worst in this regard. So Bork Creek, Nyman Creek, Pearl Creek. Uh, excessive weed growth that comes from coming in like uh, water celery, uh, Vietnamese parsley and so forth um, uh, are really choking up our, um, some of these, these waterways. Ligera siphon and oxygen weed is uh, affecting to, to cocoa stream in Takika in Golden Bay. And so that is something we need to manage the spread of those pest plants. So um, yeah, this is just a slide of, of Bork Creek where we're going this afternoon. The one on the right is the um, channel upstream of um, Berryfields Drive. And the one uh, on the left is downstream. Uh, the, the different patterns of meander um, we'll talk about when we're on, on site, but there's definitely operational channels uh, challenges for rehabilitation as well as some of those um, physical uh, challenges. That, um, so if we want to, we've recognised the need to, that we want to um, improve the catchment, then we've got to do the um, river doctor thing of, of getting all the information, working out what, what's needed. But then once we settle on a treatment and the design and everything, we have to get it right all the way through the supervision of works, um, including the planting, including the, all the digger work. And Seb's going to describe how important it is to be very close to diggers in streams when we're uh, re rehabilitating those. So um, I think now we will um, uh, take a uh, another five minute break and then we'll hand over to Seb for his detailed um, description of how we can undertake these treatments, the bioengineering uh, approaches. So um, we're very lucky to, to have uh, Seb and his experience as ecological uh, engineering integrated approach. So let's just take um, five minutes now through to 11.30, have a, have a quick break and then um, back with Seb. Thank you. Want to go see it? Yeah. So, yeah, we try to present some uh, some other aspects. Some uh, maybe I will be quite quick on some of the slides, um, just to uh, yeah to bring some uh, ideas complementary to what have been done uh, recently. Um, so just here, first slide. Uh, so each stream are different uh, and yeah it's quite um, it's quite easy to do mistakes actually i will talk about that um, so again you have to really understand the ecosystem and provide the, uh, the great solution for what you want to achieve uh, so one of the common mistake uh, is like if you got a Channelized stream considered just as a as a ditch, and you uh, plant some uh, uh, riparian forest. Uh, you will miss the opportunity to work on the hydromorphology and to bring some uh, great habitat for the wildlife. Just an example here. Uh, also, and I will talk more about that on the field trip. It will be really more easy than uh, just like that on a on a screen. Um, sometimes it's difficult to know uh, what kind of restoration uh, you want or rehabilitation you want to achieve. Uh, again, it's a matter of objective uh, constraints uh, and good analyze. You need a good team. You need um, you need good expertise, good diagnosis and to be really clear for your objective. Um, 
and sometimes yeah, there is different kind of solution you can you can go for. So um, you have to decide the best uh, solution you want to achieve, depend on your objectives. And again, I think a good start is uh, to define what do you want to have in 10 years time? What kind of species or habitat you want to find in 10 years? And try to do the design in that um, with that component. So just an example of a wetland we create here. Uh, actually, it's uh, near the near Holland. It's north of Belgium. Uh, we have to deal with intensive farming um, uh, with some nutrients and pesticides. So we decide to keep a channel to uh, digerate all those nutrients and pesticides. And the wetland was fed only with uh, the aquifer. Uh, and create really specific habitats for the bittern, which is a bird, um, and other aspects. I don't have time to explain uh, too much here, but again, we can do, we can talk more on the field. Um, so, uh, biodiversity and other aspects from a stream like hydromorphology, floods, everything is linked. Um, so it's really interesting if you have a global understanding of uh, all those aspects. Um, and yeah, so like the floodplain have a, a really huge impact on biodiversity. Um, like for in and gas spawning, uh, they can uh, go on the floodplain when it's flooding. But uh, birds and also, of course, it's um, important for uh, uh, flooding management, the floods. Um, and uh, in Western Europe, uh, uh, we didn't consider the last 100 years uh, the space for the river and river needs space. So uh, I think one of the challenges in New Zealand will be to try to have more space for river, um, uh, the more you can, so you respect more the uh, uh, physical aspect of the river, the hydromorphology and uh, the shapes and everything. So, yeah. So one of the solution is to have uh, or create buffer zones. It's like a little bit like a compromise. Um, and one of the challenges on the side, it's private land. It used to be private land. So really important that uh, to consider those buffer zone if you're not allowed to have all the floodplain back that the picture on the right is um, about it's a uh, it's a stream in New Zealand and uh, wow what's um, what's the degree of stream so urban stream are uh, a special challenge but there is solution uh, just one of the aspects but Mike told already about that um, is erosion uh, is good or bad. Um, well, that's that's a, that could be a really complex question, but again, um, erosion is necessary uh, in a, in a system for hydromorphology. So when uh, gravel from the river bank to the system, and those gravel I use as spawning areas for some species. So uh, um, again, it's participate to the hydromorphology, but also there is interaction with the like the fish habitats. Uh, and some of the uh, the bank eroded, um, uh, well, that's example from Europe, um, are used like by the, the Kingfisher. Uh, so um, maybe we can again talk more about that on the field, but uh, erosion is a natural process. Uh, what's happened in the uh, in the land where there is uh, like intensive agriculture with not really a riparian area or no space for the river with incised stream or river, uh, then the erosion become really problematic. Um, and uh, yeah, you have to deal with all the process. But uh, just be aware that erosion like floods are natural and they participate to uh, hydromorphology and also to a wildlife habitat. So they are important component. Uh, what about dead wood? Um, so 
usually what's happening, uh, uh, especially in Europe, uh, we get rid of all the deadwood uh, for flood control. Uh, but those big logs and little branches also are really part of the ecosystem. They provide good habitats for microinvertebrates and uh, like fish cover, so fish shelter. Uh, but also they participate to the hydromorphology of the stream. So uh, a big amount of log can make that the stream will go on the side and create new meanders and blah, blah. So again, it's part of the ecosystem. Uh, but of course, you can have uh, problems. And the picture on the on the right uh, is an example. So, big floods can bring those big logs into breach. So, uh, it could be a problem. So, it's it's better to design the bridge to allow the big log to go through. Of course, when it's possible. I will explain on the field how to put dead wood uh, when you do some project. There is really a a way to do it. Uh, again, I prefer to explain that this afternoon, but um, if you just put some branches and some log like, without branches, uh, it doesn't worth it. Um, you need really to be specific and understand uh, the habitats the wildlife need. Uh, when you do a design, uh, Again, we will see the link between hydromorphology and wildlife habitats here. Everything is linked. Um, so, and you have, it's better to integrate micro habitats, especially when the energy, the energy of the river or the stream is not sufficient to uh, create from the beginning those habitats. So if you are a low energy stream, uh, so I would say a low slope with um, a small floods. Uh, you definitely need a really precise design. And as Trevor said before, uh, you need an expert to be uh, near the digger and to uh, uh, really show how to make that because it's just not like a, a single recipe, a simple recipe, but it's more than that. Um, uh, each stream is different and you need some diversity uh, when you do uh, uh, your rehabilitation. That could be quite complex, but um, I will try to show uh, more and more examples. So on the picture here, what you can see is that just um, uh, an example of an island, but um, yeah, yeah, so this is yeah, this is an island, so that's part of the uh, habitats. You get a micro bay, so I call that a micro bay. I invent that word. I'm not sure. It's on the. I check on the web. I think not a lot of people use that, but it's like a, a small bay, uh, and it's act like a refuge, and it's really interesting because there is less velocity in those uh, habitats. Uh, again, yeah, a lot of. Uh, different uh, substrates. So when you look at the uh, wildlife habitats, usually we consider three things, the substrate, the velocity and the depth. So if you uh, mix the tree and you have a lot of diversity underwater, like uh, different substrate with different velocity and different depth, uh, you create plenty of micro habitats. Um, and that's really important. So micro bay is another example, but you have other kind of habitats like fish cover or specific uh, other specific shape. Uh, just the other example here uh, again that's in Europe. That's just a project we uh, do now in uh, Luxembourg. But this is a, a bank, the uh, river bank that is quite vertical, and uh, there is those all those roots of trees which is provide like a labyrinth for. Uh, uh, it's quite a complex structure, so it stabilizes the bank, but also it provides really good habitats for fish. Um, and that's a really important component of, uh, of uh, a stream if you want to uh, create good habitats. Uh, where is the arrow? Yeah, so. Yeah, so here uh, we have a uh, riffle and with plenty of uh, different sized rocks. We've got a micro bay here with a big roots of a tree here. And this is um, 
like we call in you call in English a Nox bow, but yeah, it's more it's like a hydraulic annex, also a really important uh, part of the um, habitat. Uh, again, here you can see the tree that the tree is really uh, like try to <laughs> stay on the river bank uh, and, and uh, so stabilize the bank, but also provide um, a good a good habitat. So uh, that's part that's the beginning of the bioengineering. Observe nature, uh, all the habitat you can find on the field, and try uh, in your rehabilitation project to uh, recreate that. Other example here, you can see uh, uh, the shape a little bit of the river with dead wood, with big roots of some stream, different current, uh, island, gravel, all those components are part of uh, the habitat. Uh, yeah, just a word about uh, modeling. So uh, usually hydro modeling uh, uh, is done for uh, a flood control, uh, but more and more uh, we you can use modeling, especially 2D for uh, uh, habitat, wildlife habitat, especially fish habitat, but also microinvertebrate habitat. Uh, so we start to do that. Uh, yeah, it's probably really interesting data. Uh, so you can have an approach that is more uh, mathematics. And uh, if you look at the uh, meanders here. So that's the old channel here of a little stream in uh, in Luxembourg. Uh, that is was it was channelized, straightened by the past to have the more land for agriculture, and that's the new design here with all the meanders. There is a, a mathematic formula that uh, that explained um, uh, wavelengths. So I just try to whoops. So the wavelength is from here to here. So the space between two meanders. Um, and also you got some formula between two riffle uh, and the space between pools. And you can calculate the amplitude. The amplitude of a river is like the, the floodplain width. Uh, so, and all depend mostly on energy. And this energy depend mostly on uh, the slope of the river, uh, the full. That's a really important component. So the full bank flow will decide how often you want the stream to go on the floodplain, uh, as Mike explained also. And uh, it's one of the most important parameters when you do a design. So uh, each meander for each stream has its own shape, and you have to understand that and design that properly. And each area in, in the stream, because the slope is, will be different and the flow will be different, it's all changed. So you have to integrate all those data. Yeah, just, just a little rule here. That's uh, salmon try to cross a road in the United States. Quite amazing here <laughs> during the flood. So the car has to stop. But um, uh, uh, just, just want to say that you cannot be expert in every uh, area, so uh, it's really important to uh, to create a good team uh, and to uh, to discuss the project to avoid mistakes. Uh, and so fish don't have to cross the road, but can <laughs> use can use uh, some uh, some fish pass. Uh, what I learned, uh, so I start river engineering 20 years ago and. One of the aspects uh, uh, I want to manage is just do myself some of the work. So I've done myself some of the fish pass with a digger and etc. to understand a little bit more uh, the techniques and try to test um, what kind of design we can make. And um, yeah, it's definitely important to be near the digger because near the operator because um, some of the uh, habitats are really uh, difficult to draw uh, on the plan, and um, uh, there is so you have to integrate so many diversity again. Uh, so you have to, uh, yeah, it's better if you can be really uh, on the field um, and following the work uh, quite precisely. 
precisely. Uh, yeah, another aspect of the uh, river rehabilitation is that you need a good planning. So that's a project in, uh, in Europe for the River Meuse, a uh, quite complex project, as you can imagine. A lot of people involved. Uh, it's a, it's a one, 100 million euro project. So we create all a new bank and a huge fish pass on the side. Uh, you need that good uh, to be organized and, and good planning. So uh, yeah, that's of course, um, a key for success. Uh, before uh, going a little bit further in the strategy, because I want to talk about strategy when you have a stream and you don't know exactly what to do or you need to start and how to start. Um, I just want to talk about my best mistakes <laughs> because I think it's uh, interesting to um, analyze uh what's what's wrong and as mike said also previously uh, you need a design so you you can see what's working and what's not working um you have to be really humble uh, this is nature you've got flooding this is a complex ecosystem so uh again you have to be a nice team uh try to do the best you can uh, but there is plenty of solution you can uh, you can test uh, the first example here, it's a fish pass design uh, in uh, Belgium. So uh, we try to uh, keep um, uh, a flow for uh, a meal. There was a meal that's doing some electricity here. And this is a fish pass. And as you can see, the fish pass is completely dry because after a flood, uh, we have uh, the velocity was too low here so the cover start to uh, deposit so uh, then it was too high here and the fish pass was dry so that one of my first first fish pass uh, 20 years ago and uh, yeah so you uh, definitely you can make mistake and uh, uh, a lot of the design was good but um, uh, something was wrong about transport sediment transport and uh, sediment transport is one of the a uh, huge thing to consider because you have to consider all the catchment and what's happened in the catchment and seeing in New Zealand it's also really important with what happened in some of the catchment with the forestry or intensive agriculture. So the, what's, the, what's the solution here? We narrowed the uh, upstream part and then it was okay. Uh, but just yeah again engineering and sometimes if you, even if you do modeling you just do the hydro modeling, the fish habitat, and you forget about sediment transport. So really be careful uh, about the different aspects. Uh, that's another, another uh, point here. So here on the left, it was supposed to be uh, like a pond or kind of wetland, and it's act uh, as a sediment trap. Uh, so again, um, it's about sediment. So uh, we miss an opportunity to uh, uh, do a good habitat. So uh, it's a really co complex catchment with uh, a lot of sediment from intensive agriculture in Belgium. Uh, and uh, we learned a lot about that. So uh, that's, uh, again, that's that's good sometimes to do mistake to understand a little bit more. And uh, yeah, so just try and be. On the right uh, part, uh, well, just before you do it, what, what was the mistake there? So you, you built this as a sediment trap, but then you could have created it as, as a wetland or what? what it... Yeah, so um, uh, we, uh, the first project was um, to design some uh, deflector um, that can move, uh, that we can move with a digger uh, uh, in time to, uh, to get rid of those sediment. Okay. But um, the river manager was against the project, um, and so we did a fixed deflector. But the, the fixed deflector was um, not enough to get rid of all the sediment and the, uh, the uh, kind of oxbow uh, uh, that has been created uh, was working like a sediment trap. Okay. So in that case, uh, it's really complex. Again, you have to deal with all the catchment and you cannot restore all the catchment in a, yeah, in a short term period. So 
uh, one of the best solution was maybe a, a deflector that you can move and so you can get rid of sediment in some flood. So um, that was the best solution, but we, we learned about that project. And on the right, uh, just uh, I did that on the side, really the, uh, just make some uh, diversity in the in the bank, in the river bank, and the result was amazing. And um, it was just, um, uh, yeah, nobody was really keen on that, first of all, and finally it was a really good result and it created uh, plenty of plants for birds, but also it was, we um, understand that it was a really good uh, hiding place for some fish and spawning uh, for some fish that spawn into plants. So interesting that see sometimes, yeah, just try and see what's happened. Uh, yeah, so that's another river called uh, the White River in, in Belgium. Uh, so on the on the left side, you've got this channelized river with a lot of big rocks that has been channelized in the 50s. Uh, and on the right, you've got the channel just after one year of rehabilitation. The result is not too bad, but uh, the stream is still in size. And it was again, it was like a compromise. So um, uh, the farmers on the on the side are not really keen to be flooded, but uh, so we keep the stream in size. But um, yeah, after years, we uh, uh, understand that it was a mistake. Uh, and uh, yeah, maybe we had to buy the land from the farmer to be uh, allowed to go on the floodplain because uh, uh, the, the river uh, was unstable and uh, uh, yeah, not uh, the energy, the energy on the stream on the river was too high. So there was plenty of problem with that one. So uh, yeah, so just some quick example of uh, what can be done. Uh, uh, yeah, just on the left here, it's a, it's a wetland just near a stream. So uh, sometimes you hesitate to create just a stream or a wetland, but you can create both. Uh, I would say the stream is, uh, is more active ecosystem, is moving, uh, there is erosion. So I would think it's really important to, uh, most of the time, uh, uh, re on re rehabilitation project to uh, give a little bit of priority on the stream hydromorphology and then create the wetland uh, and not create the wetland and keep the channelized uh, uh, stream and consider the stream as a, as a simple ditch. So uh, uh, that's that's quite important. As you see, there is erosion on that's just one year after uh, we dig a new channel. There is some erosion, but again, it's an natural process and tree will grow on that vertical bank and create some good habitat. So it's just a matter of time. Uh, you, sometimes you have to be patient. Uh, another example here, uh, you can see here maybe, yeah, we put some big logs in a pool. So we got a riffle here, big pool and a big woody debris here. Uh, uh, those uh, those wood debris again are really important, but again there is a a way to put them uh, and they create good cover in in some of the pool. I will insist on that this afternoon. Uh, another example here: uh, when you put a single log like this, usually it doesn't create sufficient habitats. Uh, so what you cannot see here, there is plenty of logs and we cover those logs with plenty of native plants like juncus here, um, sedges, juncus, but um, so you really have to uh, to deal with a, a great size um, uh, undercut bank uh, to be create, to create uh, nice habitats. If you do uh, two small habitats, it doesn't work. It, it does it doesn't work properly. So you have really to be ambitious uh, in your project. Uh, just some example of uh, meander we have done here. So again, just uh, just an example. Uh, uh, maybe one comment here, you see a track. Uh, we try to keep one track, so to 
appear. Uh, it's part of the uh, uh, yeah the mechanism you have to uh, uh, the planning you have to do so to limit the impact on the on your ecosystem when restoring. Again, just one example here uh, of those meanders. Uh, yeah, another stream, another example. I'll go quick on that, but uh, so about the design. So that's an example of uh, a design you can do. Uh, it's quite simple here. Uh, as you can see, there is uh, dead wood that's incorporated, but also we keep some uh, some part of the old channel. Uh, so we have. Uh, a different ecosystem here linked to the mainstream and some places are narrow and some places are large so you don't want uniformity in the shape you want a lot of diversity and uh, you can create wetland on the side uh, you can use specific machinery so that's a dumper on caterpillar really useful when you work on wetlands uh, here, just an illustration. Sorry, the picture is not really good quality, but um, uh, just to show that sometimes when you do those uh, stream rehabilitation, so the stream is uh, sorry, I have to do that. So the stream is here, the new stream, the new channel is here, uh, and we build it upstream. Um, those, this stream was in the culvert for more than 30 years, so we have to create all the new bed. And uh, it was like a wetland, so even if you are quite careful and whatever, you just create a mess sometimes. But uh, uh, yeah, that's there is no magic solution. Sometimes you have to uh, create, well, it's normal, it's part of the process. You just have to try to limit the bad impact. But, uh, so this is the stream after uh, rehabilitation. We just finished that one month ago. Oops, sorry. Uh, yeah, so just global view, but um, as you see, the little stream is really connected to the floodplain, and that's uh, definitely an interesting design with some different shape. Uh, uh, it's not uniform. There is plenty of shape and dead woods, even if it's a really small stream. And the wetland out there, definitely on the side. There is a lot of mud because it was the autumn in Europe, but uh, uh, that's quite an interesting shape with a riffle um, that's arriving to a pool. You can see it, the riffle is really narrow, but the pool is really large. So again, you need a lot of diversity and some design. Another view here. Uh, Another example on Spring Creek in France. Um, so, yeah, that's the theory here, but we had to do a uh, hydraulic modeling on that one. So we uh, we were. It was possible to create the stream uh, a dry riverbed because the stream was on a uh, on another side of the valley. Uh, temporary, so it was quite an interesting process, and you are not doing a mess, so you can uh, recreate the good shape, um, and uh, yeah, definitely. So that's the stream after rehabilitation. What you can see uh, again is that there is a lot of uh, diversity. You can see the fish shelter here with big roots. This tree was not there before. <laughs> So that's a big willow we just transplanted. So we take it with the digger and we plant it here. You can see the riffle, the pool, uh, new riffle here, and a good connection with the with the floodplain. And all those plants were also taken from the the land and uh, transplanted here. So you can do those kind of stuff. That's the same stream after a few months. Uh, and just an example here about good communication. So it's good to uh, communicate with the, the neighborhood and uh, try to explain the project. That is not only for biodiversity, but it's more about resilience and there is a link between biodiversity and flood control. So it's, uh, it's good for everybody. 
just another example in the United States uh, with my partner Confluence in Montana. So sometimes it's better to work uh, with two diggers because uh, you go, uh, you the impact is uh, less uh, on the on the ecosystem. So yeah, just uh, an example here. Uh, again, another example here. Uh, uh, of a river channel we do ourselves, so how to learn to uh, to do some shape and different try different habitat structure. Uh, we try different uh, deflector ourselves and uh, yeah, do some monitoring about fish habitats. So we learn a lot doing uh, that ourselves. Again, another project. Uh, which is uh, which was really a big success. Uh, it was impossible. Uh, the channel where it was, uh, as you see, there is a road here, the N921. So this is a big road, and the channel was here before uh, in the past. So we have to find a, an alternative solution. And again, it was not possible to go back in the past. And but we uh, try our best to restore, to rehabilitate that, and the result is really good. So, uh, yeah, again, there is many, many possibilities. Uh, if you uh, do a good diagnosis, uh, really clear with your objective, analyze those constraints, and uh, uh, try to reduce your constraint and do the best you can. Another example with big, uh, big constraints. So we are on a concrete channel here, and uh, it was more kind of fish pass than a stream rehabilitation, but uh, it was possible to uh, observe some fish spawning here. I don't know if you can see the fish here uh, at the bottom. Um, so it's spawning on the gravel, and there is plenty of other fish there waiting. So that's the female and that's the mail here. And uh, yeah, we learn a lot again with that project. So those types of rocks are very similar to what's up in the upper brook um, stream in Nelson. And that's where they're finding the uh, kawaro spawning and the bully spawning under those, um, those squarish like rocks there throughout that, that channel, the larger um, rocks there. It's, it's very important not to put rocks that are too big. Um, and uh, you can choose your rocks. You can create specific habitats uh, uh, that are not just putting like that. Uh, you can really do a design about how to put the rocks. So it's so I can explain that more on the field also to that to me. Uh, okay, a small small approach about uh, fish shelters. So uh, fish like when they can hide uh, in a secure place. Uh, so this is an example of natural. Uh, roots from trees, um, uh, and it's like a labyrinth. So the predator, like the cormorant, the shag, is it's difficult for him to get through that. So uh, you've got all those uh, piles on the water, kind of piles, and it's uh, it's a really good protection for fish. So they they love that. If you don't, uh, if it's too open space, uh, the predator can come in, and definitely it will be a bad shelter. Uh, so we, uh, well, personally, I study shelter for in a three years research program. So uh, we tried different type of shelter. We installed 500 of them, um, and structure for uh, urban areas. So yeah, we can talk about that later. But I've got quite a lot of data about that. Uh, just an example here about uh, a river in Belgium, um, and uh, sometimes it's really difficult to get some space. So, uh, one of my personal opinion here, personal point of view, uh, in New Zealand, if you can uh, have more space for the river when it's not too late, uh, please do it, <laughs> because um, uh, when it's too late, it's uh, wow, well, it's really a challenge. You 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 have no space for the river, and you have to deal with a lot of problem and constraints. So, uh, yeah. 
just a small example about the flat rocks, the importance of the, the flat rocks here. So uh, as you see in the center of the, of the screen, there is those three flat rocks uh, uh, with specific shape. Uh, they create amazing cover for fish usually, uh, and they are not uh, impacting the hydraulic. Uh, so they are really interesting structure if you want to put some uh, kind of fish shelter in the river, you can use what you call flat rocks. They are really interesting uh, without create problem with uh, uh, well, for flooding or erosion or whatever. All right, I think we can jump on the yeah on the other one. I don't know if there is some question or not. Yeah, please uh, fire away for uh, questions to see. No questions? Wow, I was, apparently I was really clear. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you didn't understand. <laughs> I just said, Mike, let me ask you a question. Uh, Mike here. Um, yeah. With all your designs, are you using modeling to support them? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, depend on the money we have to study <laughs> the design. Uh, I would say we only use modeling when there is a, a flood constraint that is really important. So like uh, you don't have to flood some uh, industry or village around. So we create an hydraulic model, but uh, most of the small creek we have done, it was more observation upstream and downstream from area where, where the stream is more natural and uh, try to understand the parameters and then you do the design. So it's more based on. Um, Elliot's got his hand up. Yeah. Yeah, hi, Seb. Hey, um, the slide yeah. when you had um, the meander and you were talking about the mess that you were making in that um, valley, it was uh, looked like a plantation forest either side of it. Yeah. When you build the stream like that, are you considering the harvest and the change to the catchment in later years? Or do you build it for the flows of the time? Uh, we try to anticipate, of course, um, but uh, yeah, those catchments are quite complex with a lot of projects going on, a lot of agriculture and forestry. So uh, yeah, you just do uh, mostly what you can. Um, and yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about that now. It was what we call also pilot project. So it's not really, it's project to learn, project to show it's possible. Um, but it was not really, uh, yeah, it was the beginning of the river restoration in, in Belgium. I'm wondering, Seb, um, I've got some photos of what, what you did um, uh, last, um, summer with um, uh, Mother Pippi. I wonder whether um, we can speak to this one. Um, and uh, I have a question um, for you. you. You mentioned that um, you used two diggers, uh, but just how one's holding, um, say, the, uh, uh, the faggot, the, the bunch of logs, while the other's doing something else. So can you just go through that, that process of, of how, what, what you did in this particular place? This is near um, the dairy factory in Takika on the Motopipi River. Yeah, well, uh, sometimes you have to use uh, two deers like in the Motopipi, we did that because um, it was all wetlands and the uh, digger were too small, the, the arm of the digger was too small to hold the, um, the logs while creating the habitat. So you need two diggers to, to hold the big logs uh, while the other is creating the habitats and then you put the big logs. So it's just uh, a question about good timing. Uh, if you don't do that, uh, the habitat you will create is not optimum. Is um, 
yeah, you will create an habitat, but not really a good design. So yeah, sometimes you have to use two diggers to be more effective. Uh, definitely. Uh, Alice has also got his hand up. Yeah. Well, sure. can we just finish uh, explaining yeah, about the mud pippy? Um, so you just got described here it was through sort of wetland, and and you redesigned this. Um, Seb, uh, yeah. Tell us about the design. Yeah, well, uh, I jump a little bit uh, quickly on that project uh, uh, without, I mean, the, the original design was just to put some logs on the side, but not to create really the shape, uh, not change the shape of the channel. So because the, if it's Spring Creek with the influence of the Takaka sometime in, in flooding, uh, I just checked the energy and uh, the substrates and uh, the, again, uh, try to focus and to determine some uh, good objectives. So one of the objective we uh, underlined here was the giant kokupu habitats. So when you have this target, you can uh, look at the habitats of the giant kokupu and then say, okay, that's the priority. Uh, what what do we want to create? And one of the aspects was to create big pools. Um, uh, so try to get rid of the sediment, but uh, create also a dynamic system. So the narrow, uh, the narrow parts you can see on the left, there is more current there, and it's driven to the big pool, and so it creates more diversity. And uh, 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 in, the, in this narrow part, uh, you have less sediment because it's, the velocity is too high. Uh, and at the same time, you can create. Um, kind of meandering stream and we put a lot of dead wood so uh, we create some good uh, fish shelters um, and that just the beginning because uh, there's a lot of riparian planting going uh, uh, mm -hmm. there and so uh, you know you need also some shade and uh, the roots of the tree of the native tree will create amazing habitats so it was a uh, interesting project between a stream and a wetland restoration in fact it's two together so again the, it's not really a stream it's not really a wetland it's it's both um yeah maybe i can explain more uh a little bit later i will go with the yeah. question so that um that sediment that you can see just in uh, front of that first log in the foreground there uh Originally, we were going to dig a lot more of that sediment out because it's very, very high in um, biological and chemical oxygen demand. And so it's sucking the oxygen out of the uh, overlying water column. But um, instead of digging it all out, which would have been such a major cost and uh, disturbance and everything, we um, are looking at locking that up with wetland plants. Um, and uh, so the carrick sector, uh, some big trees, kahekatea, uh, single stems. We are very too many trees in any one cross section. So we, we are not um, sort of blocking off that, that flood carrying capacity. Um, and uh, another feature there is the, the faggot. Isn't that one of your faggots just in, in here? Um, so yeah. yeah, fish shelter, yeah. Fish shelter, and there's another, another one down here. So it's a bundle of branches, smaller um, to medium sized branches in a particular part of the channel where the, where the water is flowing through it, right? Yeah, well, again, it's possible to do that here because uh, the energy of the river is really low. It's a spring creek. So uh, uh, if you got a big flood with a, a huge velocity and uh, it could destroy that just in one flood. So you have each stream is different. You need a good objective and a good target and uh, yeah, deal with the constraint. And Alistair, do you have a question or a comment? Uh, yeah, it was just a, a quick question for Seb. You've talked about a, a whole variety of projects that you've worked on. Is there other drivers always the same? Is it? Is it? Do you normally get engaged for stream restoration or do you have a full variety of um, drivers? Do communities come to you and say, we've got a flooding problem, can you help with this? Or, or is it purely restoration? No, there is definitely uh, plenty of different drivers, as you said, and different objectives. So um, uh, it's sometimes it's about the same, but usually, uh, yeah, it could be a really uh, 
a really different project, uh, like uh, in urban areas, uh, but sometimes we like uh, in a wildlife sanctuary. Um, uh, yeah, uh, in towns and uh, in some farms uh, with a lot of uh, agriculture and agricultural land to protect. Um, so yeah, definitely it was, sometimes it's really uh, different uh, areas with different constraints and really different projects, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just want to talk here about um, uh, some strategy. Why? Because uh, I think it's uh, it's really good to have a global view, but to act locally. But um, um, uh, this is my point of view here, um, and I just want to share that point of view. But uh, uh, of course, we can discuss that after. Um, what I observe is that it costs so much money to uh, uh, restore habitats, especially uh, what I've done recently in Europe. It's amazing. It's really costly. Uh, so what you can, well, one of my advice, advice, sorry, could be that to really preserve what could be preserved. Good population of, uh, I don't know, giant cuckoo in the area, just go and preserve that. Uh, why? Because uh, if it's really like a sanctuary, um, uh, uh, because we are not allowed to restore everything uh, in, a, in a short term, then uh, from those sanctuary uh, wildlife can spread again into uh, other parts. So it's really important to have them and not, um, yeah, to preserve that. Uh, another strategy could be to initiate pilot projects, um, ideally with scientific monitoring, because um, you will learn a lot. Um, and um, yeah, and that's a, a really good idea. And um, also what you can do is integrate ecology in each project, especially in urban areas. Uh, there is definitely some good design to do. Um, even if you don't have a lot of space, you can do amazing jobs. But um, you have to, uh, yeah, to have the knowledge and um, again, to create a good team and to be sure what you well, do the best as you can. Um, and of course, there is the long term strategy uh, and you can maybe suppress the bad impact of some uh, uh, like forestry uh, things, but uh, uh, or mitigate the impact. So just on the preservation aspects, just um, uh, so uh, there are quite a few streams, particularly in uh, Muhua, Golden Bay, where um, they're coming out of a native uh, forest catchment. They're, um, going into an area that might be straightened in, in, in the pastoral landscape uh, and then it, into an estuary, um, a relatively short distance between. Uh, those are um, areas where there's um, often there's really clean water, there's really good, um, uh, uh, the hydrology is, is much more st stable and you're, you're just um, building on the elements of uh, the positive habitat there. So you can, you can actually add a lot of value in, in a small space, whereas if a, a really a large catchment that's been highly modified over a big distance, maybe um, a lesser a priority because there are a much fewer refuges and, and sanctuaries. So that, that's what we're, we're thinking um, is, is um, just to spend the money to get best bit of value for money. I've also got a comment from Lisa. Yes. Um, Lisa, I don't know if you want to talk about this, but she just commented for future education and advocacy. Lisa recommends well before any work starts selecting several easy access photo points that will remain long term to take regular photos of restoration projects to show the yeah. process. Now examples. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, and then you've got to anticipate when the um, when your photo points get completely covered with plants and you can't see out from there anymore. So then you have to go to drones. So I think yeah, drone imagery is um, is going to be really important in this in this space. It's getting a bit more elevation onto you um, yeah. in your photos. And you and you need scientific monitoring. Um, 
to follow the, the fish population and things like that. It, it's good scientific data too. Uh, I will go quite quickly now because the, it's nearly half past 12. Uh, but I think, yeah, you've got a really good, really good opportunity here in New Zealand to do a nice job. You've got plenty of nice experts around, good university, um, and you've got space. So, uh, yeah, there is definitely some, some things to do. Uh, again, about the strategy, uh, I explained that before. So sanctuary, restore, and then biodiversity spreading. Uh, about the pilot project, uh, yeah, it's good to do those pilot projects because uh, you can uh, you can show it's possible and see the, the response of nature, which is quite amazing. And you can also learn for uh, uh, learn with the local entrepreneur, the local contractors, especially the digger operators. Um, and it's good to start with pilot projects also because you, at the beginning of the process, you've got less budget, uh, less finance, so you can, uh, uh, yeah, you can just do a small uh, scale project. Um, and also it's a great start to have a strategy locally, like what do I want in 10 years? I explained that before. Um, and you can start to work with uh, uh, private owners. Uh, so one of the other point was to how to integrate ecology uh, everywhere, in fact, to mitigate an impact um, and also yeah, to start to stop, to try to stop destroying some of the nice habitats. So when you cannot, you can use mitigation projects to try to compensate, but um, like in, uh, in the road construction, railway construction, urban streams, uh, it's quite a, a normal process. Yeah, we'll pass that on. Uh, it's back into it. Ah, uh, yeah, and I see up there. Again, yeah. Yeah. Let's see. And there is, yeah, there's just a long term uh, change, but uh, yeah, sometimes it's difficult. It's like the, uh, the forestry industry in New Zealand is. Uh, yeah, really challenging. For, uh, so yeah, you need uh, you need time to uh, to deal with that. So yeah, happy to explain more on field. Um, Mike, you've got a question or comment? Yeah, I I think it's something that is really really important. That you know what a lot of Seb has shown is scale is really important. You know the. The smaller it is, the system is, the more you can wing it. The larger it is, the more you better get it right with modeling, both hydrodynamic and sediment. You can't get away on bigger systems. You can't get away with winging it. You've got to, I understand, you know, there's an expense associated with it, but you reach a certain point where it's false economy not to do your modeling not to uh, understand your sediment transport, et cetera, because your project will fail. And so just getting a project going just for the sake of getting it going is false economy. Yeah, that's, I, I agree with that. And, uh, but uh, when we start with rehabilitation in Western Europe, um, uh, yeah, a lot of people didn't understand that it was costly to study and to design all that. So there was really a small budget for the study and more budget for the river works, for the house works. So yeah, I think now it's more uh, well known around the world that you need uh, you need a good design and you need to um, a lot of data to do a good project. Yeah, thank you, Mike. I mean, one of the things I would say is that you know, one of the reasons why modeling tends to be expensive, et cetera, is that for a long time, modeling has been, well, models themselves have been expensive. They've been proprietary. They cost a lot of money. There are a limited number of people who can use them. But there are plenty of good models around now that are freeware. Mm -hmm. Basically, they're relatively easy to use, and they should be just another tool. They're not some fancy thing that we need to kick out and, you know, have a specialist do it. I think it's really important that in this whole river business that um, we start using the tools that we have. Yeah, 
and not saying, oh, they're too expensive, you know. Yep, and uh, the, the Mutari um, upstream of Old House Road uh, is an example, at, um, or upstream of Kelling Road, all uh, big enough to really need a, a, a good model. And um, you've, you've mentioned that uh, several times, uh, Mike. So that's um, in the order of, uh, you know, a, a channel sort of two metres wide at, at base flows um, and uh, maybe, uh, I don't know, <laughs> 10 to 15 metres um, at its fullest flow. Would that be right, Mike? Is a sort of boundary between what you call a small stream? So yeah, you I get mean, away it's, with really, it's like you mentioned earlier on, stream ordering. You can probably get away with things up to about a second order stream. Um, but once you get up beyond that, you probably need to start seriously thinking about um, knowing what the essentially the distribution of energy is within the system that you are dealing with. Because essentially, it's the, it, two things will kill you in a project. And Seb showed those, basically. One is hydraulics and the other is sediment. Mm -hmm. That's excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. We are running a... Uh, Half an hour ahead of schedule, which is which is good. I, th I thought there might be a bit more discussion um, through this session, but I guess that's just partly a function of having uh, the, this uh, presentation online. People are perhaps a bit more reluctant to ask questions, maybe, uh, than in a face-to-face -face session. So I, I did allow more time for questions, but maybe we can transfer this half hour of time um, to the field, and so. We start at uh, two o'clock instead of two thirty. Would that suit everybody? I hope. I hope everybody's put aside all this this time so it, it would um, it would work. It's me. Yeah, lots of thumbs up. <laughs> great. So we can we can finish half an hour early as, as well at the at the very end of the day. So that, that's great. So um, save all your good questions, and we really look forward to a, a great interactive session by by Bork Creek. So. Um, any, uh, we have some vehicles leaving from, from Richmond here if, if people need. Um, just uh, they can contact reception to contact me or contact me on my cell phone for those who, who haven't got a ride. And uh, um, other than that, we've got some people traveling from different places. So we've got an hour and a half for, for you to, to do that and, and, and eat as, as well. So. Uh, hopefully that's that's sufficient. So there's a question from Lisa. Um, yeah, sorry, I can't make the field trip this afternoon. We've got other meetings, but I guess I just wanted to highlight sort of um, t two key aspects that I'm really concerned about, particularly from the policy space, and that's um, sufficient setbacks from of activities from from water bodies to allow the restoration to occur, particularly over the long term and dovetailing with that, the need to take sufficient land when we are actually, um, you know, seeking land to enable um, restoration of water bodies alongside a lot of the other drivers, and including um, flood protection and the like. And because I think that's the that's the make or break point as to whether we're actually going to be able to restore some of the water bodies, particularly in urban and peri-urban areas where we've got development going on. Um, you know, if we don't take it at the beginning, it sounds really expensive, but if we don't get the right amount of land, then we can't get the, the restoration outcomes that we're seeking, I think. Yep. Yeah, really, really good, Lisa. Um, but we're, we're still seeing that uh, Nelson City, just downstream of Tasman District in, in um, Saxon Creek. Again, very constrained corridor there. It had to be fully rock lined. Um, yeah, it, it's really sad to see um, some of those situations uh, continue. I guess the land is, is very valuable, and, and that is one of the reasons why that's, that's happening. Um, but um, yeah, whether that is a fundamental aspect of to Mano to why, to, if uh, we don't have the right space, then it's it's highly compromised. We're only getting a, a little bit of ecological gain. 
Just on that land value aspect, I think that is quite a key one to consider as well. And, and uh, it's something that we're wanting to look through um, in terms of the plan development, how we go about zoning the land around water bodies, because one of the key things that drive the land valuation is the zoning that it's given. And so if people have an expectation of the river that runs through their property as being zoned residential, that they will be able to do residential land use right up hard against the water body. And that's just not the case and not the message that we should be sending. So one of the things that I want to investigate through the plan is whether we actually look at separate zoning for water bodies and their margins to remove that perception that they can actually be used for those land uses and therefore start to influence the land valuation process so that it actually starts dropping the value of those water body margin areas. Yeah, that's right. Has that been done in New Zealand to zone uh, stream corridors? Um, not that I'm aware of. I am, we are going to do a bit of an audit about um, some of the regional plans that have been um, starting to be put in place under the MPS um, through the, the 2020 version, but um, yeah, we've certainly got the ability, I think, through the the national planning standards to look at an approach like that. But how easy it will be actually to get through the Schedule 1 plan making process is another story entirely. Um, you know, developers like their land areas and their land values, so um, it, it will be a challenge. But I think it's, um, you know, in terms of resolving that, that whole land value and the being able to get sufficient land and, and properly protect those riparian areas to make sure that we have those spaces free for restoration, you know, as as time and money allows. For me, that that's the the crunch point currently. So I, I think that's something that the plan can certainly look at um, in helping put in place. Yeah, awesome. Erin um, asks a question or, or makes a comment about um, opportunity with sub subdivisions to take Esplanade strips. And so I've, I've worked with our reserves team to, um, and those that it doesn't protect the smaller streams though, because um, I understand that it is a three metre um, m uh, minimum size of the, uh, from the, at the top of bank at fullest flow. And um, yeah, that, that may, may not be enough. And also the really, they don't want to take all streams. They've got a limited budget, and this is a reserves team. So um, they, they only pick those waterways that are going to be higher value and let those go that are sort of moderate or, or, or lower value. Yeah, I, th I think the pr problem's so big that it's not something we can resolve through council ownership of these areas. It's about changing people's perceptions around what margin spaces can be used for. And I think, you know, increasing the awareness that the importance of leaving riparian margin spaces for the health of rivers, uh, that whole room for rivers thing. So, yeah. Yeah, it's great. We've got questions flooding in now. Great. So um, we'll take uh, Mike Harvey and then David Stevenson. Thanks, Mike. OK, I, I think this actually is a really good conversation because it's almost as if the discussion at the moment is binary. It's not. Good restoration, good riparian corridors are also good flood control. It's not just aimed at basically the health of the waterway. It's the health of the people. Um, inevitably, if you allow the land development to drive the process, you limit the riparian corridor and the trade-off is you build stop banks and things like that. Stop banks will only work to a certain point. You can't build them big enough to solve everything. And when they do fail or overtop, then you've got a hell of a problem. So it's not by, it's not sort of a single purpose, these riparian corridors. There is a very valuable public safety element to it as well, not just environmental. And I think that's has to be a big, that has to be a recognized driver. Definitely. I, I totally agree, Mike, with you on that point. Thank you. Um, David, do you want to speak to your question, please? Oh, thanks, Trevor. Yeah. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Excellent. Yeah, so essentially, I guess it's um, like how important is it to try and replicate what used to be there um, within the constraints of the site? Or are you better off to put some improvement, even if it's not? 
necessarily what was probably there beforehand. Or in other words, are we better off to focus on a couple of streams that we can get back to, I guess, their natural uh, natural state, or are we better off to make some improvement across the board, even if it's not a perfect replica of what used to be there? Yeah, I, I guess it's all about um, the the bang for buck that we get. Um, so if you're doing just a, a little bit over a, a, a lot of places, then you might just get a few more inanga, you might maybe get a the odd band of kopu and what have you, but you won't get the full uh, species list that you, you might otherwise um, get if you put a little bit more effort in and, uh, and develop habitat for a greater range of species. So I, I um, support what Seb um, said earlier to, to, to try and, and um, look uh, at, uh, at achieving uh, our high aspirations in, in a fewer spaces and, and go for all the, the, as many fish species as you, as you can that, that would have been in, in that um, location. Uh, sometimes the um, marginal cost of doing that bit extra uh, is actually relatively small. Um, while you've got diggers on site, while you've got the designers and the supervision and everything, that's often the um, some of the biggest cost. Uh, getting the consent potentially if you if you need that. Um, so doing doing that uh, extra bit to get it up to. Close, you possibly won't get it up to exactly what it was pre-human, but um, to, to try for, for that, I think, is, is the way to go. But maybe, Seb, you want to say something more? Uh, I think we need to talk about that on the field. It will be more simple also, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, also, it could be worth talking about um, how it's not just important to think about these things when you're doing in-stream works, but when you're doing riparian works. So, before you invest a lot in planting or erosion control, can you also, is there also an opportunity to improve habitat so you don't have to go back and reverse previous work? That's right, drive the digger over riparian plantings. So it's just such a sad thing to have to do. Uh, yeah, undoing other people's work, that's not what we want to do, yeah. Mm. Uh, so uh, Shane has um, got a comment here. Uh, do you want to speak to that, Shane? Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yep. Yep. Uh, no, nothing. Nothing more to, to add. I mean, it's a. Um, it's a, this is the difficult thing for us. It, 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 excuse the pun, but the rock and a hard place that we're in is obviously landowners. Um, and a lot of the people we deal with, they don't want to lose a lot more ground. Um, however, uh, in many situations, it's in locations where, um, yeah, there is some hard decisions going to have to be made about, well, if we keep trying to contain a river in this location, um, yeah, common common physics and hydrology and geomorphology dictate that it's just, um, you can't contain it there, it wants to get out. So, um, yeah, giving it more room, um, but again, what what's probably um, a little bit missing from today, I guess, is is the landowner and the farmer aspect of it. And it's um, we can certainly come up with the ideas about how we can achieve these better ecological outcomes and 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 sort of less intervention in rivers. But it's certainly got to got to involve a, and get community and landowners on board and sometimes there's that conflicting interest where and that's generally where they will approach us as as hey i um i don't want to keep losing my land but it's 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 getting them to see in certain situations that um that containment approach is, isn't working yeah that's that's about all i had to add yeah 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 no um, that's that's a good conversation to to have um do um does it you often get the opportunity, Shane, to um, talk to the learner about the ecological uh, options. Because um, uh, sometimes I I've, um, have heard that uh, landowners have, haven't been given the option of what uh, you know, we could do this if, um, to make it healthy for streams as well. And, uh, and then explain why. Obviously, it, it's hard to say in just a couple of sentences. You have to go into uh, an explanation 
um, for it. But I, I think this is quite a lot of um, uh, sort of um, uh, pe people are really willing and, and uh, an appetite um, for uh, creating, maybe it's not going to be a, a, a full blown um, ecological uh, sort of consideration, but landowners, are, I think, are moving towards accepting something for the river. And I guess it's about talking to the landowners about Tamana Otiwai as well, that everybody's got to give something back to the, to the river, right? Oh, absolutely. And that is something we're bringing in a lot more with conversations. And it's, um, no, I, I think most, I think most people, Trevor, are aware of, of of some of the measures that we suggest and why we would do that. And a lot of the times, um, what you're triaging is, is, is the best option to prevent erosion and and the the adverse effects of that and so at times as practitioners we will veer more towards the uh, shall we say bulletproof type option not necessarily bulletproof but more robust option uh, but it's it's about realizing that you can certainly incorporate things in amongst that and with that uh, and pretty much like you say just um, giving back a little bit but it's um, yeah it's it's no people are certainly aware um but yeah yeah thank you shane appreciate that uh so alice has put his hand down but uh, then this mike is gonna hand up and lisa next go mike yeah there we go um one thing that to also consider and it's been done in other places is for specifically landowners, as opposed to in a sort of a denser riparian area, is the purchase of both flood and erosion easements. Um, that basically says, okay, rather than actually protecting this piece of this paddock, uh, what we'll do is essentially we'll buy it off you. Um, you get to use it basically until it disappears. Um, but for the great, you know, this is an investment um, because a lot of what happens is that if we harden up a bank on one place, especially in a river that is, is let's say, well out of equilibrium, as quite a few of our local ones are, then all we do is transfer the problem somewhere else. Um, and you end up ultimately having to revet or protect very large areas or lengths of both sides of the stream. So, you know, it, it's just an idea. It has been used elsewhere um, as a, an erosion easement as you take a flooding easement as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, Lisa, um, sounds like that uh, is, is uh, related to your point. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess I just um, coming back to Tamanul Te Wai uh, and the main driver for the NPS. I think if we if we looked at our designs and the with regard to the hierarchy and ask ourselves a question, you know, what does healthy water body look like in terms of that obligation one, um, and then secondly, what does you know healthy look like for uh, human health needs being obligation two, and and then actually have a look at how far away are our current, you know, designs and thinking away from those. Because if we look at it that, from that perspective, that's really the only way we're going to bring in to Mano Te Wai and into our thinking. And I, I don't know that we're there yet. So we lost you there, Lisa, towards the end. I was just saying, I, I don't know how far, um, whether we're actually there yet in terms of um, embedding the Tamanul Tuwai and the hierarchy within the way we go about designing um, restoration to make sure that, um, you know, the first thing in our minds when we are designing is what does healthy look like for fresh, for the water body itself? And then secondly, um, the human health needs in terms of flood design. Thank you. All right, well, no further questions. We'll wind up. I think perhaps we've used up another quarter of an hour. Maybe we meet at quarter past two.
sorry about this moving um, time uh, timeline, but yeah, quarter, quarter past two at um, uh, Berryfields Drive and Bulk Creek. So I think um, we hold our questions um, until there because I, I think it'll be really useful um, talking about this over some of the features that we'll see in this, this waterway.